This is Out of Line After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 566 for August 12th of 2021, Building EV Chargers Without Ever Touching the Grid. Watch Out of Line After Hours live at autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for Autoline in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Autoline After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Hello, everybody out there. I would say hello to Gary Vasilash, but he's not, not on right now. We're in Michigan. We had this massive storm come through last night. A lot of homes are without power, including Gary. He's going to join us later in the show. But for right now, our our journalist guest is Chris Pockert from Roadshow by CNET. Chris, how you doing out there? I've got power, so I'm pretty good, John. Yeah. Thank, thank you. <laughs> That's great. So, uh you been any place interesting in the last week? Driven any new cars that you really can talk about yet or no? Uh, I just drove the uh, new Jeep Grand Cherokee L um, all the way out to the Outer Banks and back uh, over the last week. And uh, I was really impressed with it. It's a very comfortable cruiser. Didn't get the chance to take it off-roading at all, but um, the level of interior polish uh, on the top top trim Summit model that I had was really fantastic. Um Got pretty good fuel economy and uh, overall a very pleasant experience. Yeah, I just got a, a chance yesterday to, uh, or the day before, to drive the new Toyota 86. Mm. You know, the the sports car that they share with uh, Subaru, the which it calls the BRZ. And uh, I can't say a whole lot about it, but as you would expect, they've improved it. Yeah, it looks like good fun. Uh, so you were out on the track then, I imagine. Out on the track, uh, we went to... Monticello, as I pronounce it, uh, everybody else seems to call it Monticello, one of the private racetracks that are uh, around the country, in this case, in New York. Yeah, the last time I was at Monticello was before they were even officially open. And with the uh, Cadillac CTSV launch, they still had one layer of tarmac to put down, but it was still a great time. Yeah, it's a pretty good track. I was impressed. I've been there before, uh, but I got in a whole lot more laps than I ever have in the past. Excellent. That sounds like a good day's work. Yeah. Hey, it looks like Gary might be about to join us here. Let's see. Is he ready to come in or not? I'm gonna, there he is. Gary, can you hear us? He, yes. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. So so this this is my, my trepidatiousness about the electric future with about 25, 25%. <laughs> talk about it, brother. Talk about it. 25% of uh, Metro Detroit is without power right now. And um, so my internet has been falling in and out and in and out. So it, should I disappear? That will be why. Yeah. Um, but Gary, okay. you and I were talking about this earlier today, uh, prepping for the show. And, and that's what right. you had said. Imagine if we're all in electric vehicles, what the heck do we do right now when the power goes down? And as, as you pointed out, when the power goes down, gas pumps don't work as well. That's okay. right. But many people tend to have a two gallon can in the garage for their um, lawn mowers or snow blowers or what have you. So, you know, so many people wouldn't be affected, but be that as it may. All right. So, so this is, this is a bit cheating because you have Chris in here. Hi, Chris. Um, so <laughs> something happened today in 1908. Something was built today for the first time in 1908. And this is the softest ball I could possibly throw. Yeah, this is uh, a soft. It's got to be the Model T because I know the Model T came out in 1908. You are absolutely correct. Oh, gosh, finally. It's been months since I got one of your questions right. <laughs> I'm feeling generous with a little electricity. Yeah, right. Well, you know, maybe we should bring in our special guest right now because he's got the solution for grids going down, Jim Bardia is uh, the CEO of a company called Change Wind Corporation. And Jim, great to have you on the show with us. Thank you for having me. So, so, so Jim, could I have one of these in my backyard and then I wouldn't have this problem? As long as your neighbors are cool with it, sure. Yeah. <laughs> 
So let me set the stage for this. Jim has come up with an axial rotating wind turbine, but he's got the jumbo size and he's put photovoltaic sails uh, uh, panels on top of it so that you can generate electricity both through wind and solar to charge electric cars. Jim, take it from there. Tell us a, a little bit about your company here and what you, you guys are proposing. Well, I mean, basically, uh, this this is a a, a a system that provides that not only makes its own electricity, but can also provide the electricity for charging automobiles. Or if you put it next to a car dealership, it could provide electricity to the car dealership. Uh, it's a um, uh, it's it, in that tower uh, is the capacity to make 36 kW uh, uh, kilowatts of uh, electricity from the wind. Uh, the solar panel, it's about 1,500 square feet. We'll make about 16 and a half uh, kilowatt hours. So you end up with uh, a 52 and a half kW uh, generator that um, uh, makes 100% uh, clean electricity. So, Jim, you're all familiar with kilowatts and kilowatt hours. And explain that to simpletons like me. How many electric cars could you charge off one of these towers? Okay, well, if the wind blows a third of the time and the sun shines 45% of the time, over a year, the machine will make 169,111 kilowatt hours. So if we were going to top off an electric car with only 20 kilowatt hours, you'd charge 8,400 of them. If you're going to put it at 40 kilowatt hours, you'd charge half that that number. Uh you know, it just comes down to however you want to work out the math from the 169,000 uh, kilowatt hours per year. But the machine is also equipped because that that tower is is basically hollow except for the generator and the transmission and all of that. Uh, you can fill it with batteries as well, so it can have a substantial amount of uh, of backup power, which is necessary when you have six cars pull up and everyone uh, wants a uh, a uh, a fast charge at, you know, 480 volts and, you know, 150 kilowatt hours. That's what I was going to ask is uh, what sort of batteries are you imagining uh, will be used in this uh, and, and what's, what size storage? Yeah, we're completely agnostic to the battery architecture. Uh, in the original work that we did uh, using uh, in this machine being applied to remote areas of the world, we found that different battery architectures work better in different climatic conditions. So we're completely agnostic on that. On that, so we can, uh, you know, we can use whatever architecture works best for that area. And if you're building these in other countries, you know, you're going to have a an architecture that's that goes with what's available there. And as to size, we have a tremendous amount of volume. I mean, we could put 300 kilowatts of storage in it if we wanted to. Jim, let me ask you a question. So if, if I think about the wind turbines that we see nowadays, the pin they're wheels. rotating, right? They're like wheels, they're rotating, right? And so, yeah. so the wind presumably is going horizontally. Yes. Your, no, wait, yours yes. is axial. So I'm thinking, you know, John has gone to the grocery store, he's walking along, he's got his bags, is he going to be near this thing and all of his stuff's going to be blowing away? I mean, is the wind going to be coming down like a... Uh, no, no, no. The wind still pillar? blows horizontal. The wind still blows horizontally. We're capturing the, that uh, that potential energy in the wind and turning it into a uh, kinetic energy, which, which runs through a drive shaft down through the transmission, down to the generator. Right, but those blades don't cause it to no, go the, vertically? No, absolutely not. It's just the opposite. As a matter of fact, when it comes to sound, the sound from this machine radiates horizontally way up in the air, whereas with a pinwheel wind turbine, the sound generates from the tips of the blade that ha that part of their arc points toward the ground. Hmm. No, just the opposite. So, Jim, you can go and plunk these towers down anywhere. You don't have to plug into the grid or anything like that. Is that You don't right? have to, but... But you would want to plug in because you want to be able to sell the excess. If there aren't enough electric cars to charge, you want to be able to sell the ele the excess power. Um, you know, at the car dealership, you know, you want to be able to to uh, you know to provide them with clean electricity as well. Are these scalable, or do you only have the one size model? Obviously, this is geared more toward 
uh, a sort of a, a retail or commercial application. This isn't something like you would put in, in Gary's backyard necessarily. Well, this machine would probably be a little large for Gary's backyard, not knowing where he lives, <laughs> but I'm going to assume that. Um, the um, So the machine is scalable the way that uh, uh, it's, well, I say it's scalable all the way up to 252 kW, but that's only made possible because of the levitation hub that I invented all the way back uh, 10 years or so ago, which allows all of that uh, rotating mass to uh, uh, to be lifted from, uh, to not cause any friction at the bearing surface. Go into that a little bit more, because I think that's key to your design here. I mean, it's it's actually a takeoff of something that we use on cars. You know, we have dub, we have opposing conical bearings, like on the front hub of a car. I mean, if you ever taken one of those apart, you know, you have conical bearings. So basically, what I'm doing is I'm applying magnetic repulsion. You know, when magnets push away from one another, to to lift the the races away from one another. So we can adjust the the amount of, of pressure by adjusting the uh, the magnets. So it's like a linear motor. Mm. I mean, using the magnets and using the gap between the two. Yeah, actually, surfaces. yeah, something like that. I mean, we're 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 yeah. the the bearings that you would normally have on the hub of a car uh, are now stacked, and between those is a magnetic force that separates the needles from the races. Can you provide some context about where you are in terms of development and or production? Are these things that are already out in the field being deployed? Are there full-size prototypes that are working or are you more in the proof of concept stage? No, we've never built the electric vehicle charging system. I mean, I, I designed this all the way back in 2007. In 2009, after like 17 tries, we had a machine that we put up in a farm in Pennsylvania. That ran for five years and actually survived uh, Hurricane Irene and Sandy. And um, uh, and then we eventually took that down because we were going to go in, into full scale production and we were going to do um, uh, forensic analysis on it. And that never came through. So we've actually just laid dormant until the uh, the need for electric cars came along. And now all of a sudden we had a generating system with a real immediate need. So where do you stand in terms of getting the money to, to put this into production? You know, since, since the, the electric vehicle situation came to be, uh, we've been contacted by uh, two prominent you know, level two investment banks uh, that, um, uh, that have an interest in, uh, in funding the operation. So any ideas when you might be able to start uh, putting these things up? It, the, the trigger point of that is going to be when, the, when that equity capital is made available. I mean, I can share with you that one of the investment banks is flying in next week to meet with us. So, you know, we'll move at the pace of capital. Yeah. So let's talk the cost of these. What, what would it cost to, to put up one of these towers? The machine, uh, before the investment tax credit, it's $484,000. Uh, after the investment tax credit, it's three seventy six six sixty. dollars And if you, if you want to figure that out, uh, extrapolate that, that number out for what it costs you per kilowatt hour on a 30 year LC levelized cost of, of energy calculation. It costs you less than six and a half cents per kilowatt hour. That's dirt cheap. Okay. So, so Jim, I, I did a little research since I know absolutely nothing about uh, charging electric vehicles. And so I wanted to see what the cost of a commercial DC fast charging station would cost okay right. so you can get one that produces 50 kilowatts for 28 grand one that does 150 kilowatts for 75 grand or one that does 350 kilowatts for 140 grand so how does that work with your math well i mean our, our math is, is based on on our annual production now you have to understand we're not a charger we're a generating system so the EV chargers are your, that you're most likely referring to right. depend on the grid for their energy source. So easy calculation is they're going to be paying 12 or 13 cents per kilowatt hour. In our case, we're making the electricity. And so far, up till now, we don't have to pay for the daylight or the, uh, or the wind. So all we're amortizing is, is the cost of the asset. 
Okay, so so in the case of my going out and buying one, I would have to pay for the unit, and then I'd have to pay for the electricity going into the unit. With of yours, course. you buy they it. They are the electricity, and, and the whole thing is wrapped into one. Right. So you yeah. have r really uh, next to zero variable cost. In fact, you might even have negative variable cost if you can sell your excess electricity back into the grid. Right. Yeah, your break even has got to vary pretty dramatically based on location. I would think, for instance, in California, where the cost of energy is a lot higher, and you probably get more sun load and wind load depending on where you are, right. you could make your money back a lot quicker than you are, say, here in Metro Detroit. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the calculation, if you run the calculation without, and the, the other advantage is since we're a renewable energy generating system, we also generate carbon offset credits, and those have a value as well. Because we're saving 262 tons of CO2 per year, uh, based on the, the production numbers that I that I gave you. Yeah, so that's you another know, revenue stream. Tesla made a pretty nice uh, amount of money and continues to make a nice amount of yeah. money by selling carbon credits. Right. So, Jim, is is there any issue in terms of zoning for these units to be installed? Uh, <laughs> I think that what we're going. I think that we we will find that it's going to be increasingly harder for any community to stand in the way of devices that uh, eliminate the our need uh, or the generation of CO2. Um, yeah, I'm, there, I'm sure there's going to be someone that uh, that's against it, but at the end of the day, if you're against renewable energy, you're against our planet. <laughs> Right, but hey, we, people are people are for cell phones, and and there are lots of communities that do not want a cell phone tower in their neighborhood. Then they can continue to have polluting cars in their neighborhood. Is there anything to say that you in in your your pictures here and your renderings, you've got them in parking lots essentially? Is there any to say, anything to say that you couldn't put them on some remote hill somewhere and then feed the power and and have it be available, you know, a half mile away? No, not at all. I mean, there, there are line losses to, you know, uh, sending electricity over uh, long distances. But no, there, there's no, you know, nothing limiting that. It's And, you know, I mean, I could see, you know, places like Moab needing these things for the people that are going to be buying the electric off-road vehicles. Hey, it also got, seems, sorry, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to say, it also seems like these might be ripe for advertising as well, uh, although that's a different zoning question. <laughs> Actually, my, one of my patents actually covers a uh, uh, gives me patent protection for a 360 degree infinitely programmable uh, LED signage that would display from the machine as it rotates. <laughs> but that's another topic. <laughs> we, we've got some comments and questions or mo mostly comments from viewers here. Alan Jacobson says every car has to park somewhere. Just put an outlet there. Uh, public chargers that you have to go to is not the solution. And BT says they need to put charger at destinations where people go uh, and spend time at, like grocery stores, boat launches, movie theaters, malls, hiking trails, cool. beaches, restaurants. Yep. You, you seem to be saying that'd be perfect for your application. Absolutely. Big box stores, uh, uh, rest areas on public highways. I mean, at the end of the day, I think that people that drive electric vehicles need to know that they can refuel somewhere. And... You know, that becomes really critical when you think of the fact that we have 150,000 gas stations with uh, like 1.2 million fuel nozzles for a process that takes three minutes, whereas an electric vehicle fast charge takes 30. So, so Jim, let me ask you, okay, so, you know, you, you were saying that, you know, you, you need the wind to blow a third of the time and the sun to be out 45% of the time. Okay. Um, now, are you looking to place these in areas like the Southwest of, of the United States versus say the Northeast of the United States. No. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it, you know, it, in Michigan, let's say in the winter, there's like virtually no sun ever. Now right. we do get wind, but like, forget about the sun. So yeah. it, it, it seems to me that that might be a bit of a challenge. And I mean, if there isn't some storage mechanism in your system, I mean, wouldn't the, the, charging be variable well i mean the the system comes with charge with uh, with storage but so to your point the um you know a canopy solar charging station in michigan 
would suffer greatly from the time in Michigan where the sun doesn't shine very much. Whereas this machine located right next to it with its 1500 feet of solar panel would be able to provide electricity from the wind. It's not a perfect solution. It will not work in every single location. And the performance will ver vary depending on the amount of wind and the amount of, uh, of sunshine. I, I like the idea. I mean, uh, you know, the Biden administration has just set a goal of 50% EV sales yeah. from the total market by the end of the decade. We all know uh, amongst the public, the number one concern is where do I plug in? And this seems to be a solution uh, in certain areas of being able to address that rather quickly. I mean, we see it as clean electricity for clean driving. And and the ability for someone to look down the road and see this thing and say, gee, I know I can go there and charge up. Because I've yeah, heard stories we're... of people in EVs arriving at a charging station and there was a power issue. I have experienced that personally, and it's tremendously frustrating uh, on a number of occasions. And uh, this would take that, you know, that issue out of the equation. I think we're in an environment now where there's not going to be any one solution to these issues. So the idea of a regional solution or, um, you know, one of, of several different ways to attack the problem is, is, is just makes good sense. Yeah. Here's another thing I like about it. Man, is that visible? You know, when we were showing the pictures at the truck stop or the car dealership, pow, that thing just jumps in. And I'm saying that because grid connections, another comment from uh, uh, our viewers, said he, he'd like to hear my take on EV charging signs on highways that are all along the West Coast. Uh, and that's uh, apparently what you do. You drive up and down the highways and, you know, you'll see big billboards that'll tell you what gas stations are at what exit, or at least we've got that here in Michigan and other states as well. But um, you don't see any place that indicates where there's an electric charging station. And I've had people ask me all the time, well, if I get an EV, where am I going to plug in? And I said, mm -hmm. no problem. You know, they're everywhere. All you have to do is go to the screen of your EV and it will show you where the, the nearest place to charge is. But because or an the, app on your phone or an app on your phone, but because the public who are not into EVs don't see EV charging stations, they just assume there's nothing out there. Whereas Jim, with your solution here, wowza, everybody would know where there's a charging station. It's visible for miles. And even if your infotainment system tells you where that charging station is, the conventional charger, your Tesla supercharger, um, your Electrify America charger, it can often be a pain to find exactly where that charger is within that parking lot that you're circling around and around trying to figure it out. Um, it's because they're so discreet. Clear. Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so Jim, this, this puts you sort of in a, in a catch 22 situation. On the one hand, it's very obvious, which it is, is good for people who are looking for the electricity. But on the other hand, it's very obvious. And if people are, you know, trying to sell their wares on that shopping district, they may not be so happy. We can't please everyone. Our objective here is to try to help clean our planet and try to provide uh, uh, some comfort to the people that drive electric vehicles that when they see one of these machines, they're almost guaranteed of being able to charge their car. Jim, what's your uh, business model? Would you sell these? Would you uh, operate them under lease? Uh, how, how do you plan to go to market? Well, I mean, I don't think that we have reached a final uh, decision on that. Uh, all of those three are viable options. Uh, considering the fact that this is a, a renewable energy uh, uh, machine, it could also be packaged into uh, sustainable infrastructure uh, real estate investment trusts huh. and benefit from that tra tax credit strategy in addition to the investment tax credit and the revenue stream from the carbon offset credits. Uh, and the fact that the machine may, yeah, I mean, the machine generates over $90,000 worth of revenue a year just uh, selling the electricity. Jim, let me ask you two engineering questions. Sure. Number one, um, what is it made out of and what does it weigh? And number two, is, is there a greater efficiency in terms of using the wind by having the axial approach rather than as you perfectly described it, the pinwheel approach? Well, I'll answer the second question first. 
the in order for a pinwheel wind turbine to function, it has to find the direction of the wind and rotate into the wind. So, you know, all of us have experienced wind gusts, and you know that wind gusts kind of come and go very quickly. A, a, vert, a horizontal axis, a pinwheel wind turbine can never take advantage of those because of the dwell time for it to rotate around into the wind. So that the having the, the vertical axis machine sees the wind regardless of the direction that it comes in from. So we're, we're getting, we're, we're able to utilize much more of the available wind. Plus with, with a vertical axis wind turbine, they will function in turbulence, whereas turbulence really affects the the efficiency of a pinwheel wind turbine. So that's that's an you know it's just that's an engineering advantage. Uh, so that's the reason that I went with this design initially, which has been around for over 300 years. But they had there was a, a an Achilles heel to it, which was reliability. Uh, and maintenance issues, and all of that came down to all of that weight that sits on top of that tower, all that. And that's what I solved with the levitation hub. Hmm. To answer your question about the materials, it's a it's a it's a series of different materials. There's ferrous metal, there's non-ferrous metal, there's an eight-speed sequential transmission in there that you would put in a in a formula car. Uh, there's a uh, a big honking generator. There's digital controls like. Uh, you know, we would use in any of our cars now, um, you know, so it, there's a lot of different materials. Joe, uh, we got another uh, viewer question here. In fact, this is my question too. Uh, 47 Solar wants to know, can a consumer size device be created for home deployment? The, the machine is completely scalable down or up, but our upper limit right now that we know can be done is 252 kW. We have no current plans to do that, but the engineering on this is much like Legos in the way that it assembles and uh, uh, and the entire internal architecture. So to answer his question, yes, that's possible. It's just not in our immediate plans. Yeah, well, I, I like that idea a lot. You know, if uh, if you live in the snow belt area and you want to go uh, solar, for example, the Department of Energy actually recommends that you do solar and wind because to Gary's point in the, the winter time, our days are so short. We just don't get as much sunshine, but we get a lot of wind in the winter. Conversely during the summer, when there's very long days being so far North, we, we typically don't get a whole lot of wind. So that's what they recommend. And that's why I love your idea. I mean, I, I would love to have one of these things at my house. Well, well, we'll certainly get one for you when you're ready. <laughs> Real good. Hey, we're going to have to wrap up the segment at this time. But, Jim, thanks so much for coming on the show. I, I know you're not in production yet, but we always like to provide our viewers with what some of the bleeding edge ideas are. And you definitely got a bleeding edge idea here. Thank you for having me. And, Jim, I could have used it today. So. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Well, keep my number. All right. Oh, yeah. No, we're going to keep an eye on you guys and the best of success because uh, this is an intriguing idea. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. okay we're going to take a quick commercial break right now. Give a shout out, out of thanks to our sponsors. And we'll be back talking about a whole lot of things going on in the automotive industry. Right, we're back talking all things automotive. But so, I want so, one of those windmills or whatever you, you want do. to call it, wind generators. <laughs> I can imagine them so, being useful for off the grid things too. You know, you've got some of the remote beach homes that are 
very expensive and downscaled or what have you, or, uh, um, you know, maybe some scientific exploration things down at the poles, who knows? And, and, you know, if you, if you lived in a box house, like apparently Elon now is living in, um, it would even be perfect. So, so speaking of whom, John, you, you apparently are reading Kim Higgins book on Elon. What's your take? Well, you know, I'm only halfway through it. And, and for those who don't know, Tim Higgins is a colleague of ours, uh, works for the Wall Street Journal, but just wrote like uh, uh, the history of Tesla. A lot of behind the scenes stuff, a lot of very personal things, uh, how these personalities crashed. Elon against Martin Eberhard, Elon against uh, Peter Rawlinson. And uh, that's about where I'm at right now. But what I've taken out of it is that uh elon is uh, he's a little bit weird let's put it that way but man is he gee, what a surprise yeah, gee, what a, he's very focused he's driving like a maniac and the company wouldn't be where it is today without him you know he pushed for all kinds of things which caused all kinds of turmoil and trouble but i gotta say in the end he was right and, and, you know, like I said, I'm only halfway through the book. I, I've still got a lot, lot more to learn, but it's pretty good. You know, it's interesting that you call him very focused. And I, I tend to agree with you. And he certainly has a long term vision and uh, sort of a damn the torpedoes management style that's gotten a lot of things accomplished. But he also has a lot of distractions, you know, whether it's social media stuff or it's tequila or flamethrowers or, or all these other things that you would never see a traditional CEO dabbling in. Right. And that, that's what makes Elon Elon, right? I mean, uh, this is what makes so many people, you know, so ardently in favor of what he's doing. You know, they, they like all this stuff. Um, you know, he probably could be a little bit farther down the road right now if his interpersonal skills were better. But by the same token, like I said, he had all kinds of experts saying, no, you can't do this or no, that doesn't make sense or this isn't going to work at all. And just sheer dint of personality pushed through all that. And in the end run, uh, you know, he's proven to be right largely. And and I tell you, the more and more I read this book, the more and more he reminds me of the original Henry Ford. I think yeah. the two of them would have been pals. Henry would have invited him on those camping trips he used to do with uh, Thomas Edison and Harvey Firestone. You know, it would have been Elon Musk right in the camp with them. <laughs> So, so speaking of uh, inviting him to places, um, you you mentioned John in in the last segment about uh, Biden's um, plan to bring us to fifty percent EVs by twenty thirty, and when he brought people to the White House, he brought people from General Motors, he brought people from Ford, he brought people from Stellantis, but there was no Elon Musk, so. What was that all about? Well, that's about the UAW. I mean, the UAW was also invited to the oh. White House and make no mistake that unions and the UAW in particular, you know, they're a hundred percent behind Biden. And, uh, you know, he owes allegiance. I I'm not going to say allegiance, but, you know, he owes them, you know, a certain amount of his political capital, right? Because they helped get him elected. And Elon's adamantly against the union or any union, it would seem coming into a shop. In fact, none of the startups want a union whatsoever. That's why none of them, not just Elon, none of them were invited to the white house. Um, I suspect there's going to be some other sort of meeting down the road where the Biden administration will put a spotlight on, on some of the startups like Tesla and, and Rivian and anyone who looks like they might be successful. But, uh, that's why of my reading of the tea leaves, why there was no Elon Musk at the White House, because, you know, he's demonstrated that he's pretty much anti-union and Joe Biden was not going to abide by that, at least for this meeting. So, but Chris, what do you what do you think about this whole notion that that Biden is putting forth as you know, a goal to have the 50 percent of thereabouts of, of electric vehicles in, in a comparatively short period of time? Uh, it's not even a comparatively short period of time. It's just straight out. A com it is a short period of time. Uh, it is a tremendously ambitious target. Um, you know, I, I note that it would outlast, um, 
you know, two terms for him. Um, and it's a little bit, you know, further out that way. Um, but I, I do think it's important to have those North Star targets that are really ambitious. And certainly the costs have come down for EVs and interest is ramping as more models come to market. Um, I don't look at it as being a terribly uh, realistic goal. Um, but I think if if it was too conservative, then it would, you know, have other issues. And I think we'd, we're probably better off um, with, with this sort of this sort of target. But you got to remember that right now, what EVs are two percent of the market in the U.S. Something like that, um, and we talked about the charging infrastructure issue. Um, you know, there's there's a charger for one out of every 2,500, 2,600 cars in the U.S. right now. Uh, that's a problem, right? Um, there was actually, and I have this somewhere. Um, so there's an outfit called um, Mobilize.ai, a company that analyzes where to put EV infrastructure, and they came out with um, a report. Um, they did this in, in with support from the Toyota Mobility Foundation, and it, it found that only 9.7% of people in the 50 largest U.S. cities have a public charger within a five-minute walk of home. Remove the top two performers, New York and L.A., and the figure drops to 6.2%. So there isn't a whole lot of uh, charging infrastructure, as, as you point out, uh, a, a, a serious problem, um, especially when there seems to be a gas station on damn near every corner, even in the middle of nowhere. And, and not only that, when you go to a gas station, there might be one pump that's out of order uh, on, a, on an inf infrequent basis. But if you've charged a lot of EVs, you know um, especially on these third-party networks, these Electrify Americas and, and such, that there seems to be an awful lot of downtime. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's seriously frustrating, as is the fact that, you know, if you're you're not, in you know, using a, a Tesla supercharger, that you need to have seven or eight different apps on your phone, depending on where right. you are and your, you know, different credit cards. It's, it's, it's kind of a mess. And I think streamlining that will go a long way toward making EV, EVs a much more mi viable solution for many more consumers. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, Herbert Deese, who runs Volkswagen, um, put out a tweet. He was on a trip to Italy this past week, and he stopped at a station, um, and this was an Ionity station, which is, um, so this this was a combination of BMW and Mercedes and Ford, and I'm leaving somebody out, I think. Um, did I say VW? I guess I did. No, you did Okay, so VW is in there as well, and 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 he was was highly frustrated when he went because, as you say, Chris, I mean, it was it was a problem getting a a, a fast charger that would work, and he said there was no coffee available, and it's just like, what is this? This is crazy. Um, so it's got to be a whole different mindset. Yeah, I think the other thing is, you know, as as we get vehicles with longer and longer range, uh, and more and more people are able to just charge at home, and or you know, maybe the batteries are big enough that you you charge them overnight, and you may even only need your level two or sometimes not depending on your uh, usage cycle that they just get used to not going to those, those gas station equivalents uh, out there. And um, that's something that I think only people can get familiar with um, through trial and, and through having their neighbors, having those experiences and having their evangelist down the street, you know, that's got a Maki that says, this is such a wonderful experience. Well, you know, what we're talking about here shows, and we've talked about this before, that EV adoption is going to vary by region. It's going to vary by market segment. It's going to vary by market demographics. You know, uh, for some people, EVs are good to go right now. You know, if you got a garage and can plug in there and have a level two charger, I mean, you, you're ready to go. But if you're somebody who does not have a place to plug in every night, or you're somebody who drives a lot of miles, long trips, you're probably not going to adopt to an EV until either the range gets a whole lot longer, the charging time gets a lot faster, and there's a lot more charging stations. So, you know, we're just going to have to see, at least in the U.S., how quickly that infrastructure gets put into place. We're, we're talking about, you know, Biden making this, you know, executive suggestion. That's basically what it comes down to. It's not really an order. I mean, you can't make this happen. It's not a law. I mean, this is this is a, a positive suggestion on his behalf. But at the same time, the EPA is is redoing the the fuel efficiency rules, and um, the way they seem to be written, um, IHS Market has has come out and said that in order for a car company to sort of hit those metrics, that by model year twenty. 
26, again, that's, that's even a shorter time, Chris, um, 2026, that they have to have at least 18% of battery electric vehicles being sold from their fleet, okay? Um, so uh, according to the IHS numbers, um, you know, they're, they're saying that in 2021, it'll come in at 3% battery electric vehicles, okay? There'll be 1.3% of plug-in hybrid vehicles, uh, and 6% of non-plug-in hybrids, okay? But by 2030, they're anticipating battery electric vehicles being at 32.3%, okay? Now, this is certainly lower than the 50% we're talking about, but again, these guys are analysts who are crunching the numbers and looking at all types of powertrains, you know, right across the board, and um, whereas this year, internal combustion engines represent 87% of the market, they see this going down to 13.2% by 2030, okay? That's pure, so, pure ICE, right? Pure ICE. Yeah. Um, not a 48 volt not system. including hybrids of any sort. Not including, just... Um, but, you know, Gary, listen to what you're saying there. That's the stick. You know, okay, so Biden's EV, you know thing as a suggestion, like you say. But when you start to look at those EPA numbers, that's the stick. That's what's going to force automakers to figure out how to sell more EVs. And that's the situation that we see in Europe, where the fines, if you miss the CO2 targets, get to be horrendous. So horrendous, in fact, it's cheaper to sell an EV at a loss than to sell an ICE and pay the fine. Yeah, I think that's also why you see automakers starting to look at some of the bigger, more profit rich vehicles, the pickup trucks, um, where they have a better shot at, uh, you know, potentially making a, a profit on these things so that they, that can be, you know, metered out across the entire range of products where there are a lot of segments that they probably won't make any money on for the foreseeable future. You know, another, another thing, um, you know, persuading people that this is in their economic best interest to get a vehicle. I mean, so, so, um, you know, as, as you guys know, there are, are federal and, and oftentimes state or local tax credits that you can apply to the purchase of an electric vehicle, and they begin to look very attractive compared to an ICE. Um, and, you know, that was, you know, part of the infrastructure bill where they're still talking about having these credits. But it was interesting, and this, this almost slipped by, that over the weekend, the Senate came up with a non-binding amendment for EV rebates, whereby they said, that if you make over a hundred grand, no rebate for you. And this is the thing that I completely do not understand. If the vehicle costs over 40 grand, no rebate. So how many, how many EVs are out there that are less than 40 grand? Yeah, I, I, I understand the idea behind not wanting to in, unnecessarily incentivize the already uh, financially well-to-do to get EVs, but the $40,000 price tag is too low. We know that that's already less than the average cost of a new vehicle today. Um, and hundred thousand dollars goes a long way here in Michigan uh, for household income. If you're out in California where they're probably, you know, by far the most EVs, the most charging stations and the easiest uh, way to make those transitions, hundred thousand dollars doesn't go very far in a lot of those communities. Yeah. But I understand the pol politics of it because uh, there were a lot of people that were pissed off that people who were buying the original model S at $120,000 were getting taxpayer money to go spend that on a new car. And so I, I, I can't argue with it. You know, we can quibble over whether $40,000 for the car is too low or $100,000 is too low for a household income. Nonetheless, that's the political reality of what it's going to take because remember, the Repo Republicans in the Senate who are like, over my dead body, are we going to give incentives for electric vehicles? This is the political process. This is what the compromise has devolved down to, to mm -hmm. get some sort of credits out there. And, you know, look, when you think of it, the Leaf, the, the Bolt, the Bolt EUV, um, there, there's more than a handful of EVs out there right now that would easily qualify for that kind of credit. The it real seems like there could be a tiered credit, you know, well, that it... That that decreases uh, depending on, on MSRP or transaction price. Yeah, it could be. But remember, you know, right now the credit is a $7,500 tax write-off from your federal taxes. 
a lot of people don't even have $7,500 to, to write off in their federal taxes. So to me, the real question is, is, is the new incentive just going to be a check by an electric car and you get a check as long as it costs less than 40 grand and you don't make over a hundred grand, or is it going to still be some sort of tax credit? My, I know that there's been pushes in the Senate to make it just a, you know, a clear rebate, buy an electric, get a, get a check from the government. Well, speaking of buying things, um, Kia announced this week that they're starting this program called Kia and then the at sign that we're all familiar with, home. So Kia at home. And so what this is in a, in a variety of cities in the United States, Atlanta, Austin, Boston, Chicago, LA, Miami, New York, Philadelphia, Seattle, Cleveland, Columbus, Dallas, Fort Worth, and so on, that there are two vehicles. One is the Carnival minivan, which they call an MPV. And they'll probably be all upset that I said minivan because that seems to be a not a good word. So that and the Nero EV. And so part of the thing is, is that it allows people to schedule test drives and they will bring the vehicle to your house or your office or wherever for you to test drive the vehicle. Okay. So, you know, we're hearing more and more about people wanting to basically buy vehicles over the internet. Carvana has the situation where um, they will come to bring the vehicle to your house if you don't want to go to one of their um, their sites. Um, do you guys see this as, as being part of an, an inevitable shift in the way that cars are purchased? Well, we're already yes. seeing that shift. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. No, I, I, apologies. Um, yes, I think it absolutely is. It's, it's, you know, it's funny. We're, we're talking about this as, as if it's new technology or a new idea We're we're going back to the age of the fuller brush man here, um, <laughs> where they're going to show you in your house, how it works with your lifestyle. Um, and I think it makes sense with the vehicles in particular, they're choosing, um, because you know, the, the carnival is obviously a family vehicle. And if you don't have to schlep all your kids into the dealership and you can say like, Oh, look, junior fits his, you know, here and his car seat goes in easy here. And you see how it interacts with your your family and your life, and it fits in your garage. Uh, it makes things a, a lot easier. Um, and you know, I think we eventually will get to the point where, um, you know, there maybe we're getting away a little bit from the um, the culture where you buy off the lot, and we're going toward a, a bit more of an order culture. I think that's going to take a long time, but you've heard Ford talk about that too. So having somebody come to your house and show you a vehicle, and then ordering it with you, and then it's it's you know available for you. Uh, the way you designed it a few weeks later um, or, or a few months later sounds sounds kind of attractive. And we've already seen, you know, that Tesla's made a lot of headway in that regard, too. Yeah, just to add to what Chris has said, uh, it's a well-known fact. Any salesperson in the auto industry will tell you that putting butts in seats for a test drive is the fastest way to close a sale. Doesn't guarantee it, but, you know, the old rule of thumb used to be that one out of every four people who walk into a car dealership will buy a car. I, I think that's all jumbled up with COVID and the way things are going right now. But there's no question that if you get them into the showroom and you get them into a test drive, your chances of making a sale grow up dramatically. So I, I think it's brilliant for Kia to be able to do this. Even more important when it comes to electric cars. Because people just don't know what is it like and all that fastest way to convince somebody that an electric car could be for them, put the butt in the seat and let them go drive it. But, you know, it really strikes me that it, it completely changes the model. I mean, you know, Chris, to your point, it is it is like the Fuller Brush Man or the person who'd come over and, vac you know, throw crap on your floor and then vacuum it and say, oh, look how great this is. Um, but, I mean, you just think about the the way the model has existed in terms of selling cars in this country for so very long. I mean, you go to them, they don't come to you. And, you know, that 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 really shifts things up. And uh, um, I think their dealers are going to have to rethink models of, of, you know, the profitability of their businesses. It's, it's also, it's a different mental equation for both parties, right? Um, for a long time, uh, the car buying process has been seen as adversarial. Uh, you're walking into the, the dealership um, you know, there's talk of people, you know, withholding their their keys while they're doing the F and I deals and all that sort of thing. 
Uh, and it's generally regarded as a hostile process. I think the majority of consumers don't want to go to a car dealership. They don't enjoy that experience. Um, and, you know, there's an element of, of you know, normalcy and comfort in being in your own home and being able to say, you know, I will meet you here at this appointed time on my terms, on my turf. Uh, and if I don't like what you're saying or I don't like your product, I can just say, get out of my home. Well, let's see how that plans play, plays out. Because remember, Genesis tried to do that early on. They were going to send a sales rep to your home who would explain the whole car for you, let you take a test drive. And turned out a lot of wealthy people did not want strangers knowing where their homes were. You know, and I, I've seen that in a lot of upscale communities. There is a, a grave concern about security. Hmm. And they just didn't want people coming to their house. Well, I can I, see I that, think- but... I- I can also see now is the time with the age of COVID where people don't want to go out in public uh, and they, they want to be exposed to fewer numbers of people. Um, and now is the time to make that mental transition. Right. I, I was going to say that it, it, it strikes me that, that one of the issues that I think they have to face is how this scales. Okay. If, if it's wildly successful, I, I don't think they're going to have enough people to be able to make it viable going forward. I mean, this, this, this goes back to the, the, the point of, so, um, you know, companies that are, are doing pickup and delivery for service for people's vehicles. Okay. Um, and you know, at some point you don't have a sufficient number of porters to deal with the, with the number of cars and therefore you make unhappy customers because, you know, I want my car's oil changed on Tuesday. What do you mean? I can't have an appointment until Friday, you know, then you're, ah, um, a bad thing. Um, you know, something caught my eye that I, I thought was rather interesting um, that Renault, the French based company, and Gili, the China based company, are getting together. They signed a, a, a memorandum of understanding whereby the two companies are going to be working together in China and in South Korea on hybrid vehicles. Okay. And this, this is, is beyond making, this is sales and service and so on. And, you know, I started thinking, okay, Geely, we've, we've talked about that company on the show many times, John. And um, so I, I've got a list of, of all of the elements of Geely. So there's Geely Auto Group, Volvo Car Group, Geely New Energy Commercial Vehicle Group, Geely Technology Group, My Time Group, Geely Auto, Lincoln Co., Polestar, London Electric Vehicle Company, they make the black cabs now, Ferrazen Auto, Proton, Lotus, Terrafugia, the flying uh, car company, and Geely owns 9.7% of Daimler, the big thing, not just the Mercedes part, 9.7% of Daimler, which makes it the biggest shareholder of the German company. So I ask you guys, is this not the most interesting car company in the world? It's yeah, a good it is. question. Yeah. Well, and and you know the the founder and I guess he's still CEO Li Shufu is I mean th- this guy's amazing, and and keep in mind too, Geely is privately held. This is not one of those government owned companies. You know, this guy did it all on his own, and I want to say like thirty years ago he was making like refrigerators for kitchens. So to see what he's built up is extraordinary. But to answer your question, Gary, I, I think he's overreached here. That's way too much stuff. I mean, you know, even in a decentralized organization, Yowza, that's so much to keep track of. And, uh, you know, I think he'd be better off picking a few targets where he think he can be really successful rather than just throwing out this big net and seeing what he can catch. I'm inclined to agree with you, John. I think there's questions about where these individual brands go, where they overlap. Here in the U.S., we we have Proton, uh, sorry, Proton. We have uh, Polestar, right, which is the Volvo spinoff, and it's supposed to be the the all EV brand, but that's very rapidly where Volvo is going. Right now, they happen to look a lot alike styling-wise. Uh, and then they want to bring Lincoln Co. still to the U.S., uh, which is basically a very similar product, uh, but maybe with a ride share component and people have been getting away from ride share lately. Um, there's just a lot of brands to figure out, let alone all the other little ones that they've got knocking around like Zeker and uh, Proton out of Malaysia. I think they even have an interest in smart. Uh, that's probably the Daimler tie-in. Oh yeah, it's a joint venture they do. It's that they're making the smart car in China. 
Yeah, it's 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 a lot of brands. It's a lot of spinning plates. You know, but it's interesting. So, so John, I, I think it was on last week. No, we didn't have a show last week because we were in Traverse City. And when we were in Traverse City for the management briefing seminars, um, Swami Kodagirdi, who is the new CEO of Magna, was was up there. And um, he, he was the keynote speaker. And um, so the week before, we were talking about um, the deal that, that Magna had with Vianeer, which now may be unraveling as Qualcomm has suddenly decided that it wants Vianeer. And I'm told there's another company that's going to come in and put a bid in there too. <laughs> I mean, these Vianeer guys were like probably a year ago, they're probably sitting there going, damn, you know, this, this, this business is really hard if we only had some interest. And now they're just probably fending off of all of these, uh, all of these suitors. But anyway, so, so the, we were talking about how, you know, Magna is in so many businesses now and Magna has so many things going. And, and I and I happened to run into Swami and, and I talked to him and I asked him about that. I said, you know, Swami, you know, you, you've got this this new job. It's a new big job. It's 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 but, you know, isn't the company getting so big and how do you manage the thing? And he basically said, you know, the, the way we have the, the company segmented and the way that people are empowered to do their jobs, he says, it's it's not that difficult for me to manage because basically you know, the, the level of, of management that is exceedingly important is in each of the individual units. So, so maybe in the case of, of Gili, they could just basically have an infinite number of companies. Very possibly. <laughs> you know, I was very interested to learn uh, Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Warren Buffett and uh, that whole group. They manage an amazing variety of businesses, except that they don't manage them. It's to your point. It's very decentralized. I, I, I think he said their corporate headquarters only has 50 or 60 people. And uh, who's the guy that's his business partner? I think the guy's named Jim Munger. Charlie Munger. Charlie Munger was saying, hey, you know, one of these days, Harvard Business School is going to do a business case study on how we run this thing. Because he says, we, we've really figured out how to manage a, a very disparate organization with a very small staff. But here's the difference with Magna and Geely. Uh, Magna... I mean, it's a supplier. Everything that it does is parts and components or technology or software or whatever that goes into a car. Li Shu Fu is going off in all kinds of directions. You know, it, it's not uh, something that, you know, collectively makes a lot of sense. Magna can actually get a lot of synergies, even though it doesn't run the business that way. But all its different business units sort of tie into one thing. Not so with Geely. They're all over the map. In fact, they have brands that compete with each other uh, versus Magna is business to business. Yeah, but you you could you could make the argument that that back in the day when General Motors was the biggest corporation on earth, it had divisions that were competing with each other, despite you know the the stair step every person purpose. Um, and back then, they were doing okay. They were, but it was a different world. Remember, it was an oligopoly. It was GM, Ford, and Chrysler. And then you had a few other smaller players, but, you know, General Motors had damn near 50% market share. And if you want to grow to be that big, you've got to be able to tolerate some overlap and some inefficiencies. That's what it takes to get to be that big. And, but that era for General Motors, certainly that's long gone. Hmm. Maybe this is what he's planning on doing. 50% of the market, Geely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So the, here, here's something that that also caught my eye, and and this 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 would be our last subject here. Um, now, now talk about being snake bit. S the Nissan Smyrna plant is going to be shutting down for two weeks. Now, the Smyrna plant is where they make the Rogue, which is highly successful and and just very nice um, compact crossover. The Pathfinder, new car, very important to them and the Infiniti QX60 and other products. The reason they're going to shut down is because a Malaysian semiconductor factory has had a COVID outbreak. Semiconductors, COVID. Okay, so here's my question to you guys. Which long-term is going to have a bigger effect on the auto industry, the pandemic or the lack of semiconductors? I wish well, I had that, that, that music. Number one, we don't know where this pandemic is going. You know, yeah. 
You take us back to, to March. I thought easy breezy vaccination. It's done. And guess what? It's not done. Now we got this variant. Who knows? There's probably going to be another variant. So we don't know if this pandemic is even over yet. The good news is we can sort of learn to work with it. So, you know, if you look just in the United States and it's happening elsewhere, but I can talk more uh, uh, knowledgeably about it. You know, GM Ford Chrysler Group, uh, they're doing the mask thing. They're doing social distancing. They're blah, 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 contact tracing and all this other stuff. They're not having any outbreaks in their plants. And so it can be managed. The chip shortage, uh, it can't be managed unless you just build more facilities and they cost a fortune and it takes several years to put them up. But once they're up, the chip shortage should be over and done with. So I guess what I'm talking myself into saying is COVID's the bigger problem. I think it's it's just too big of an unknown. And I think the the variants like Delta and and how long that'll uh, you know take to play out, um, it, it's, it's very hard to say. But as you point out, it is a question of just build the factories that get the supply chains in order and, and it'll, it'll solve that. But it, it also does bring to mind again, now how we've gone to just in time for the entire business for all these components, um, how one little thing, one little factory catching on fire somewhere can can disrupt an entire business. I mean, you're, you're talking about Nissan, but today we also um, saw what happened with the, uh, the Ford Broncos problematic production uh, related to the Webasto tops. Um, and, and basically there's just, they're building trucks and, and sitting them in holding pens and uh, they, they can't deliver them. And, and that's what happens when you uh, don't vertically integrate. And, and I understand why the industry doesn't do that as much as they do used to do. Um, but there's always downsides. Do, do you think that that might cause the industry to rethink what it's doing and maybe go for more vertical integration? I mean, we were talking about Tesla, of course, and, and Elon is famously um, pretty much vertically integrated compared to other companies. I think Tesla is really the the, the bigger um, contributor to that thought process. And we've already seen a lot of people sort of change their tune about um, battery production in general. But I, I, there's there are going to be things that make sense to take in-house, and there are going to be an awful lot of things that it doesn't make any sense to do that with. I mean, John, you remember very well when um, the, like Ford and General Motors um, both had components group and then groups. And then at one point in time, they thought, aha, there's more valuable for, it's more valuable to us if we have Visteon and Delphi, right? And we'll, we'll spin these off. And so the components will be elsewhere. And uh, uh, do, do you think that that's maybe biting them in the rear end now? No, I, well, you got to remember what drove them to uh, outsource so much to suppliers. It was because when those part components were part of GM and Ford, they were paying UAW wages. And meanwhile, there were suppliers making the same kinds of parts and components for far less labor cost, half the labor cost. And that's when they said, this is a no-brainer, just outsource this stuff. So that's what drove that de-vertical integration uh, during the, the 80s, 90s, when we saw this massive amount of outsourcing take place. But it, it comes down to what can you be better at than the supplier industry? So Webasto presumably makes more roof systems than anybody else. So any one individual OEM probably can't match their economy of scale. Uh, and besides, that's not core. What the, what the OEMs are focused on right now is making battery cell production and pack production and electric motor production, making that core and bringing that in-house. I think that's where we're going to see a lot more vertical integration. But what could easily happen, NIDEC, for example, is the name of the company that makes more electric motors than anybody in the world. They think that they're going to get 50% market share down the road because, again, they're going to have more economy of scale than any one single automaker. But since the technology right now in batteries and electric motors is still kind of in its baby stages, there's huge room for uh, having a competitive uh, advantage if you've got a technological edge. And, you know, when you look at GM right now, certainly it thinks it's got a competitive edge with its Ultium system. Tesla clearly thinks it has a competitive edge. So they're not going to outsource those things. But that could easily change down the road when the technology matures and there's suppliers who can actually make it cheaper than any OEM can. What do you think, Chris? 
I think that makes perfect sense to me. It's going to be fun to watch how this all pans out. Um, but I, it, it's, it's interesting now that there's just so many variables in this business. We took for granted for a long time that this was the, this was the way, this is the way you built a vehicle. This is the way you sold a vehicle. This is the way you marketed a vehicle. It's all out the window now. And do and you think it sticks or, or that, that, you know, if, if, if we come to some, some normalcy that, it reverts back. I mean, you were, you were suggesting earlier that that maybe people would be willing to order vehicles. Maybe people would be willing to have people come to their house for test drives and so on um, because of you know changes that are being wrought by 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 COVID. That if if that goes away, I mean, is it just like back to normal? I think certain certain things will stick, I and mean, we already know that uh, on the buying end of things, there are a lot of people that don't even like to go and test drive a vehicle. They just basically wanted to show up at their house and 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 not have to do anything. Um, so the the idea of purchasing things online is already something that younger people are much more comfortable with than than folks of older generations. And it's more of a natural part uh, of their their day to day uh, and and almost an expectation in certain ways. So I think the buying model is changing, especially considering most people consider that to be kind of an uncomfortable adversarial process that that they want to change. Yeah. Isn't that a crazy thing if you think about it? That I mean, that, that there are people who truly love cars. I mean, they just you know they get it. They're out there polishing it every Saturday morning, and and and. But in order to get that, it's it's like basically having to go get a root canal. I mean, it's um... yeah, that's true. Whether it's a new or a used vehicle, generally speaking, you know, if you're prowling the your Craigslist or Facebook ads and trying to sort through what's real and what's not, um, it's it's a difficult buying process. Mm -hmm. Look, this is exactly why Tesla and all the other startups don't want to go through the dealer network. It's exactly that. Well, it will be interesting to see. And in 2030, we'll have the three of us back to do a show and we'll see whether or not it's 50% or 32.3% in terms of electric vehicles. Yeah. All right. right. Okay. Chris, thanks for coming on. Good having you on the show. Wonderful to be back. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thanks, Chris. Real good, Gary. We'll okay. do it again next week. We will. Okay. See ya. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.